This episode of the Golf Guru Show is sponsored by EnviedHemp.com. That's E-N-V-E-E-D Hemp.com. I'm happy to say that Enveed has been my choice for my CBD needs for almost three years now, and I can't begin to tell you how it's improved my life. Uh, They come in three formulas, clarity, relief, and relax. I typically take a clarity drop in the morning with my coffee to get me focused and ready to go for the day. Uh, Some relief for my aches and pains or inflammation after a run or a workout. And then I do a drop of relax before I go to bed that helps me get some of the best sleep that I've had in years. And my whoop band now tells me that it's definitely helping because my recovery scores have been higher than ever. Enveed Hemp CBD come in drops, roll-ons, and gummies. So you can take it however you choose. So go to enveedhemp.com and make sure you use the guru code guru20 for a 20% discount for life. You heard it right, 20% discount for life. CBD is a great supplement to keep you healthy and safe in these crazy times. So go get it. So let's get to today's episode. It's not what you know, it's what you can prove. You know how to cut to the core of me, Baxter. You're so wise, but like a miniature Buddha covered in hair. I want to become a guru so girls will like me. Then I will like myself. Now before we do this, let's go over the ground rules. Rule number one. No touching of the hair or face. Of course. And that's it! Now let's do this! Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Golf Guru Show. I am Jason Sutton, Director of Instruction at the beautiful Colleton River Club in Bluffton, South Carolina. On episode 125, my guest is Eric Alpenfelds. Eric is a Golf Magazine Top 100 instructor and a Golf Digest Top 50 instructor and is the Director of Instruction at the Pinehurst Golf Academy. Eric has been one of the top golf instructors in our industry for a while now and a good friend of mine for many years so i was excited to sit down with him at our carolina section fall teaching summit this past week for my first podcast that i've recorded in front of a live audience uh, which was really cool and we had a lot of fun with it but before we get to this awesome conversation uh, make sure you hit that purple subscribe button so you don't miss any future shows coming your way as i have some amazing guests that i'm very excited to share with you Uh, So without further delay, let's get to my conversation with my friend, Eric Alpenfeld. Enjoy. All right, everybody, starts here. So those of you that don't know me, my name is Ben Weeks. I'm an extraordinary section. I really appreciate all of you guys being out here today. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking our community chairman, Mark LaPointe. I really for all the setting all this up, making all this happen, and our entire committee. Uh, Thank you all of you for your involvement. Uh, with no further ado, we're very excited to have Eric Allen Bells here tonight, uh, top 100 instructor for the last several years uh, at Pioneer Resort, uh, as well as the golf guru himself, Jason Sutton. Thank you both for being here tonight and taking the time to interview with us. No Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, so, so first off, yeah, thank, thanks to Ben, thanks to Mark and the, and the committee for allowing me to be a part of this. I'm really excited to spend some time with my friend Eric here and for him to share his vast knowledge of of teaching and and some other cool stuff that we're going to get into. So welcome to the Golf Guru Show live version. This is the first time I've done this live over 125 episodes and I'm still a little bit nervous, but welcome, Eric. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. All right. So before we get into your backstory, Mm -hmm. uh, which I think would be interesting I reached out to a few of our mutual friends, and I've got a question about your wardrobe choice. Oh, jeez. God. Is it true, there's a, there's, a, there's a rumor out there that your favorite color shirt is black or navy, and that's all you wear? Pretty true much. or false? True. You know who I'm talking about. Oh, I know. I know exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. That guy's going to be teaching chipping for the next two years. <laughs> Yeah, so, so elaborate on that. He said there's a reason why. There's got to be because you're, well, you're a smart guy. Well, you're we a researcher. Were, we were bored one time, and, and there was an argument amongst the staff that uh, the lighter color shirts would be cooler in the summer. 
And so we actually did a test. I mean, this is during golf schools. We're kind of bored with the students. So we thought we'd uh, do a quick test, and we put shirts on chairs. We put shirts on people, and we did a quick, we did a quick little study, and we figured out that the shirt on the human body isn't any hotter if it's black, blue, or white, it's, or any cooler. It's the same temperature. It's the, it's the fabric that makes the bigger deal. So we tested it out, <laughs> and I've just stuck with that since then. Well, it has to save time in the morning, right? It's kind of like yeah, Einstein. It's, yeah, it's not hard <laughs> to figure out. What, uh, now, the trouble is i got a couple guys on the staff that, uh, well, part of it, too, is that I, I work with some people that they have. Everybody has shirts they're supposed to wear. Right. And i got two or three guys that can't remember what shirt to wear on what day. And so we're in disarray anyway, so why bother? I just figured one. Well, I heard that you actually have branched out and started wearing pink a little bit. I did. I branched out and wore <laughs> pink. I'm so, God, this is brutal. Uh, yeah, this is exactly what I thought I'd share my knowledge on about. Or this, uh, yeah. Hey, we got to have Sun a nice Sunday and right? Thursday we wear pink. And uh, that's uh, a tribute to uh, Robert Hoadley and Kelly Mitchum, who felt that that was a really good color to wear on the last day of the school. And so I do wear those shirts. And... Um, it's, I usually wear a sweater, to be honest with you, cover it up. <laughs> I love it. All right, so let's start from the beginning, yep. right? I always like to get the backstory sure. of kind of how you got into golf and then also how it led to coaching. So how are you as a kid? Sort of give us, paint the picture for us. I was, uh, I played, I grew up in Boulder, Colorado, just outside of Boulder in a small town called Lafayette, in between Lafayette and Louisville, which if you've ever been out there, it's really, at the time, was rural and farmland and all that. And uh, so I played a lot of team sports, and golf was really nothing we ever did because it was not a sport that, that we had access to. Uh, but my dad started playing golf when I was 14, and I got uh, a chance to go with him to the driving range while he would play on Saturdays. And I kind of I just got enthralled with it and ran into some guys that were good players at these driving ranges that were teachers and players and just kind of hit the right people at the right time and, and kind of got hooked into the game. And uh, probably for me, the, the, the interesting thing was that watching these guys as players in Colorado, they were some of the top players, and they just made it look really easy. And it's like, how hard can this be? And then you actually swing a club, and it's like, all right, this is a lot more. <laughs> Golf is hard. Yeah, a little bit harder than that. <laughs> and I think I got hooked on it that way. Plus, it wasn't a team sport, so you didn't have to wait around for everybody else to show up. You can go play. And so that's kind of where I got started as a 14-year-old. You, did you go to play in college? I like, played, give us the I give us the story. One year in school down in Texas, uh, at a school called Stephen F. Austin, and, and found mm -hmm. that I was probably a better golfer than I was a student. Which, if you know me as a student, that's not really <laughs> saying much right there. Uh, so at, at that point, I, I decided that I was going to go work on my game with a guy named Jim Hardy, who was a teacher out in California that my dad had met, and I had taken a couple lessons from over the years. And uh, so I went out to California, watched. Jim teach and I worked on my game for a couple years there and uh, at the same time a guy named Hank Haney was here at Pinehurst and Hank had basically done the same thing I did probably 10 years before me where he, he just watched Jim teach and uh, had an opportunity to uh, teach with the Jacob schools and, and groups like that so I was following the same footsteps more or less and uh, Hank was here at the time at Pinehurst and Jim said go out to Pinehurst so I've got you an intern job and that's how I started here. So you, you interned for, for Hank, and then mm -hmm. how did that lead to being uh, the director of instruction? Probably about six months. Uh, now, an intern back in those days. I'm not going to let you skip over this. Yeah. Well, an intern back in those days was basically you got up and you made sure that uh, maybe Hank had a cup of coffee, Mike LeBeau's shoes were shined, I mean, whatever. You, you had to do <laughs> stuff like that. Or you took tea times or you cleaned the carts. And so inter the internship was not all that exciting, but it did give you a chance to get your foot in the door and, and start teaching if you were if they felt comfortable with you mm -hmm. and basically about six months into it they had lost an instructor and um, it was one of those situations where I was able to fill in because of my background with Jim Hardy and you know basically Hank just took me aside and said listen we need you to teach why don't you do that chipping thing that Jim would do the little presentation and I'd watch it so many times I didn't really know what I was doing for sure but at least I was able to present the material mm -hmm. and so that just worked its way into a full-time teacher so that was 1985. And that's when you became the DOI? Uh, probably 94 is when I became yeah, the yeah. director of instruction, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. All right, so you mentioned Jim Hardy, mm -hmm. Hank Haney. You got some pretty good guys right. to, to yeah, learn from stumbled there. Into that. I mean, yeah, sure who, who were some of your other mentors, and what did you learn from them Well, I think probably the most was from Jim uh, because I spent so many 
days with him. I spent mm -hmm. about two years in California watching him teach, and I, I've always been an advocate of, of observation and learning through that process, and I, I just feel like it was, for me, the, the ideal way to do it. Uh, but I would, would read the books he would give me. His wife at the time was a gal named Carol Mann, so I would listen to her talk to the players that she worked with, and she was still active on the tour some. So I just had an opportunity to be around some really pretty amazing people. So for me, I guess, for sure, Jim Hardy, Hank Haney, uh, Mike LeBeau was here at the time when I moved here. Uh, John, a guy named John Phillips was here as a teacher as well. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't even know this, but Jack Lumpkin was the director of instruction back in 1983 at Pinehurst. Yeah, I didn't know that. And so Jack was here with Sandy LeBeau, or Sandy Lumpkin at the time. She married Mike, and uh, so just the, just the opportunities were there to, uh, and our schools were just in the infancy. I mean, I, the yeah. first first school I taught was probably 1985, and it, we I think we that year we had six schools, seven schools. Now we are going to do next year we'll do nearly a hundred. That's crazy, and and the golf schools are have kind of diminished over I mean, the years. Over you know, the, I mean, yeah. I worked at for Dana for yeah, years, and. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, a it's, tough, it's a tough industry, I think. Yeah. Uh, we've been, luckily, we've, we've been able to uh, keep our numbers up. We'll do about 1,000 people. We'll do just under 1,000 people this year uh, through the school program, not just not individual lessons, but just the, the schools themselves. So it, it's, uh, but it's a tough industry. It's, tough, it's a tough business because of the, the, just the variables that come into it. What are, what are those variables? You I, I think don't mind. For, no, I think, I think there's so many great instructors that it's hard to, compete against an instructor that could do individual lessons for you. Mm. Uh, and our, our packages are a combination of hotel, room and board, the golf. I mean, our, our, our fee's pretty steep. So it's, right. not, it's not like a $150 lesson with a, with a teacher out here that's extremely skilled. It's a, it's a $4,000 weekend. Yeah, it's, so it's, a, just, it's an experience, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's, it's a little bit more than just the individual stuff. In, in the, in the, the expectation is that. Right. So, so, so over, <clears throat> over the years that I've known you, I know you've, you've done a lot of, a lot of coaching, but you've also done a lot of research projects mm -hmm. for like golf magazine, golf digest, uh, which I've found kind of fascinating because I'm a big fan of doing a study yeah. to sort of oh, sure, find yeah. some, find some underlying, most of yeah. the time I, th when I finish a study, like I figure I don't know anything. Yeah. Right. But what have you like describe, I got two questions. One, describe your favorite studies mm -hmm. and what you sort of learned from them. And then I got a follow up for that. Sure. The, uh, the history of our, our research started with a gal named Carol Mann. I mentioned her name earlier, but back in 1992, she introduced me to a guy named Bob Christina, which I think the vast majority of you probably have met or, yeah. or know. And uh, Bob was in, at Greensboro University, or University of North Carolina, Greensboro, rather. And she introduced uh, us to get to each other because because I was trying to figure out what we could do that would set our program apart and trying to find a niche that would be a little different than other programs. And I saw the research as being something that was not only interesting, but also maybe a void in the industry at the time. And so she introduced me to Bob. We started doing some research. So we've been doing research uh, since basically 1993. And we've done, over the years, we've done probably 45, 50 significant studies. And by significant meaning, you know, they're three-month studies, you've got 72 people involved. There's hundreds of hours of gathering the data. There's the analysis of the data, and then it gets presented to an audience of uh, golf pros maybe in the PGA material that you, you might be reading or uh, golf magazine, or primarily we, we present it at scientific environments where there's like the World's Congress of Golf or MIT right. or something like that. that. And that was my follow-up, and we can get to some of your, your findings, but – what what encompasses a good research study? Like how much data points do you need? Yeah. How, like what would be sure. your your well, it's, idea? It's, uh, everyone's a little, can be a little different, but I think probably for us the the genesis of a research study is uh, the argument we'll have back and forth, or with the people we're partnering with would be all right. Let's just say we're going to go down this that rap this rabbit hole of a question. I mean, who cares? You know, what are we going to find at the end that could be intriguing? Yeah. So we try to do things that are substantial. And so, uh, you know, maybe a study would be uh, looking at, and this is one we did a few years ago, we looked at different swing cues and styles of cues. Uh, and so basically when you're given a lesson, a swing cue is going to fall into the category of an external cue or an internal cue. An in internal cue would be coming from the instructor that would, that would be, you'd be telling the student, hey, turn your shoulders or shift your weight or whatever thing you'd be telling them that would be more body focused. An external cue would be where you'd be focusing on the club, 
the ball flight, maybe the club face, the shaft, something like that. So there, anything you're going to tell a student as a cue is going to call into those two categories. And so what we wanted to do was, was compare two cues, two styles of cues, internal against external, and see which one would be more effective with different types of swing issues. And so we picked the most common thing, which would be a, a downswing path over the top and that's swinging out to in. In our student base, probably 93% of our students are swinging out to in and 7% are swinging in to out. So it's a dominant trend in our students, at least, and um, something that uh, was pretty easy to find people to participate in because right. everybody's doing it. Yeah. Uh, one hard to find subjects. But the idea is that now you pit those two against each other. So the thought would be, when we designed the study, how can you study it in the quickest amount of time to where you can get 72 people through and not take an hour with each person? You can maybe do it in 45 minutes and do multiple things. Or it's just you're trying to figure out what's the easiest way to get it done. Did you tell them what the study was about, or did you have them go in uh, blind? That's kind of interesting. It was a little bit. It was it was a blind in this, and we you know, basically the way we set this the study up is that they. They got it. They knew that they were coming in for an out to in or over the top. Okay, study so they knew what the, they knew what the deal was. Way, yeah, but the the way they were organized was just randomly where this person would go into the group that got the inter internal. The next person that fit a, a demographic would go external, and then we also had a third group where actually they were in control of what they were going to be thinking about. So they were given the option in looking at the video, hey, how would you fix this? And they were given the option of fixing it themselves with what they wanted to work on. So we had internal, external, and then kind of your choice. And so you know, back to when you're designing a study, you're trying to figure out what's the quickest way to do it. Is it going to be an impactful uh, finding maybe? Is there something that would be unique about it? And then the other thing is that what other research and other sports would be would it be supported by the findings? And external cues in other sports have been studied for years by a gal named Gabriella Wolf. And so it's not really what we... Kind of the outcome we had was really not anything different than she would have anticipated. It's just never been applied to golf. And so we, we studied external, internal, and basically when it boiled down to it, the external cue, and what we did for, for that was that imagine an alignment stick down that would be on the target, and then that was a, a yellow alignment stick, and then an orange alignment stick was pointing to the right about at a 20-degree angle, and the golfer would try to swing the club head on the, align the orange alignment rod out to the right of the target, so end out. And uh, the, in the internal cue was more the traditional drop your elbow to the side, drop your right shoulder down, and try to come from that direction with the, with the body. So internal, external, and then the third group just was able to come up with whatever they would do to fix it, and they had kind of the dominant internal cue idea that is at least in our students probably 75 percent of the people that we work with come into the golf school predisposed to an internal cue everything they work on in their swing is typically internal so 75 percent of the time that's the cue and they don't really use a lot of external cues so anyway that's kind of the same matchup with the with the control group and so we gave them a chance to fix it on their own and surprisingly enough the control group made more progress than the internal cue group. So Interesting. The, the, the better swing changes were external from a standpoint of video. We measured on video. We measured on uh, the outcome of, uh, with a track man. And then we had uh, the, uh, the next group was the control group or the group that basically kind of did it on their own or kind of figured out what they would work on. And then the internal cue was the least productive. Now, everybody made changes. Don't get me wrong. Everybody made improvements because they were working on it for 54 swings. They had a I was about to say, how, much, how, yeah. much did, how many reps did they get? Yeah, they did 54. Okay. 54 swings, which to us was an opportunity. You know, we, we can see changes in a technique within 45 swings. Now, again, that's on the range in a practice environment. doesn't mean they can carry it out to the golf course, just meaning that they can, you can measure it and see changes in the technique in a brief, in pretty quick amount of time, actually. You know, 45 swings is not that many, really. Yeah, right. Uh, but that's, that was kind of that study. So that would be how we design it and kind of the, the idea, again, would be what can we do that would be significant. Mm -hmm. And we, sometimes we test, we challenge, uh, we challenge ideas. Uh, we did one a couple years ago uh, under the, the idea of the aim small, miss small. You know, that strategy of aiming at a very finite Spieth. target. Yeah. yeah. And so we, we tried to do a research. Just we tried to figure out what research would support the idea of aiming at a very finite target. You know, the aim small, miss small strategy is aim at, a, aim at the, f the flag itself or the flag stick itself or aim at a, a tree limb, not a general area. 
and we couldn't find any research that would support that in golf. Uh, the only research we found was in target shooting and archery that would support <laughs> that theory. Interesting. And so we figured we'd put it to the test, and aim small, miss small didn't work for the amateur golfer, I can tell you that much. They were, I mean, the findings were pretty surprising, actually. I, I think when you tell somebody to aim at the middle of the fairway, but they've got the width of the fairway to hit, and it still would be a successful shot, but still try to hit as close to the middle as you can, that's a different approach and mental side of it than if you say I want you to aim it at that stake that's dead center of the fairway and you got to get it as close as you can and ironically enough the wider the target the tighter the dispersion was to the middle of the fairway mm -hmm. or the green and the more they aimed at the middle of the green or the middle of the fairway the dispersion got wider so it was the actual opposite interesting yeah the only time it held up was in putting Talk, that there talk, wasn't much, there wasn't much about difference that. yeah it'd be as far as if you gave people a very finite a coin the size of a dime and said try to hit it in that circle or the cup they it, it sometimes they did better with the smaller circle but even then on the lag putting it was better with the bigger circle so even then it didn't really hold up all that much so any other studies that come to mind or it, and how i guess another follow-up how has that changed the way you teach or if, oh, yeah. if any well for me it, it has because i i, I guess it's uh, and I think I learned this from Jim Hardy, that one of, the, one of the first books he ever gave me was a book called The Search for the Perfect Swing by a guy named Alistair McKin Alistair McKenzie, maybe, and mm. Stobbs, or so what was it? Yeah, 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 sorry, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah there you Tom, go. Yeah, I didn't think of it. Yeah. And uh, I, I was fascinated by that book because it really brought into play not anecdotal discussions of topics, but really, really here's what the research says. And I've always kind of tried to approach it that way. So for me... The idea of doing research that could maybe help myself or help our teachers or help our students just made a lot of sense. And I have to circle back to in 1992 when I approached Don Pageant Sr. about doing research. His, his thought was, I'll do whatever you want to do. So I'll support you in any way you need support. And you know, just go out there and figure out what's going to make our program better. So our strategy was always that we would do research that could be disseminated into the staff, the students, and then if anybody else wanted to become aware of it, we'd, we'd try to find an outlet like a, a golf magazine or something like that. Yeah. So you it got is driven it's, it's driven internally to try to help our program, yeah. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. I spent some time with Sasha McKenzie at yeah. our Top 100, which I kind of lead into, and just talking to a guy like that that has so much scientific research backing everything that he does yeah it, it kind of questions a lot of the stuff that we teach every day doesn't it well it, it, and i think everybody has but it, you should and you should be that way right yeah, well, yeah, i mean a good research study should make you question what you're doing and should make you give you 10 more questions i, mean, I think i mean yeah i mean the internal external swing cue that was that was interesting we found that it was very helpful for a downswing path if you gave one one cue to another i mean but it's a pretty small sampling of the swing cues you can give. Mm -hmm. And is there, is there really an easier way? I mean, let's say somebody has bad posture. Can't you just put them in good posture? That's all internal cues. You know, get your shoulders back, chin yeah. up, whatever it is. I, I don't really know external cues to do that. So sometimes internal cues just make a lot more sense. But right. it's, again, it just gets you thinking that maybe you do too many. So part of, you know, I think probably to go to what you were asking just a second ago, how does it influence our teaching? Part of our goal in group instruction. I'm, I'm a creature of group instruction. I mean, everything, 85% of the teaching I do is in a golf school setting. So I've got groups of people I'm teaching with, and I try to pair them up. I try to pair up with me, somebody that's maybe a little less external cue given, driven and more internal cue, and I try to make sure that who's in pitching and chipping and putting has a balance so the student can get a different perspective on it or a different way to think of it. Uh, the whole idea of, uh, I, you know, we don't really disagree much on technique issues. You know, club face is closed. The path is incorrect. The, mm -hmm. the dynamic loft nuts, right? The hits are on the toe. I mean, it's not all that complex diagnosing. It's how you're going to fix it. Right. So if you, ha if you give people different strategies to fix it, that's where the, the, maybe the, the important part is. Have you heard or done much research in the constraints-led learning approach? Hmm. Tell me what, tell me yeah, it's more like, similar to kind of what you're talking about, but... It's almost like putting things in the way or putting or changing the environment, oh, yeah, I got right, it. to, yeah. to, and not giving the student 
the answer all the time and sort of letting them figure it out on their own. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's a, there's a balance there for sure well, I, that I where you can lose somebody, but it, I, I've, I've been really fascinated with that. Well, I think it's, I think in our study on that internal external external, we, we would use the phrase at the time would be self discovery. They were kind of figuring out on their own yeah. what they want to do. Mm-hmm. I think with that study, probably what I try to remind the, the guys I, get the pleasure of teaching with is that, hey, maybe this, maybe we should listen to what the student's saying because they, they might have a pretty good idea on how they, they think they should fix it. Right. And what better way to get somebody engaged in it if, if you say, as the coach, hey, tell me how you want to fix it. Let's, let's, they're they're going to be a lot more engaged in it because they're not going to want to fail. So yeah. they'll give it a lot more effort too, by the way. So. I, I love that. Yeah. It's, I spent some time with Dr. Mark Bull. If you don't know him, movement specialist. Yeah. And he always asks the question, if you if if I came to you moving this way, how would you fix me? And it almost puts it back on the student. And of course, a lot of our students don't have great self awareness yeah. of what they're doing, but I think it's a great avenue. Plus, it gives them some ownership yeah. of of really being a part of the of the solution. We do video on day one, obviously, for the diagnosis of a, of the of their ball flight and all that. But then on day two, we do video as well and and my my strategy with doing video is a follow-up on the second day of a school which we do four day and three day schools so we're going to do video on the last day anyway to show the before and after idea but part of the second day video is to show them the progress they're making and also that i warn them when they come into the video hey listen we're going to be looking at what you did yesterday and we want to see the progress from yesterday to today well, they're paying a lot more attention when they know they're going to have to watch themselves sh- show the progress they've made over sure. the course of the 24 hours. They're not going to, they're going to be paying attention. You might not, you might not have fixed it, but you're, it's going to be better. It's a little bit better at least. Yeah. I love it. So, so and one of the questions I was going to ask you is sort of, it, let's, let's go from golf school to private lesson. Mm-hmm. Like what would be the structure if a new student came to you, give us sort of the structure and the highlights of how you, would go through a, a lesson, like say an hour lesson with somebody, a new student. Yeah, I think I think probably for me the the new student would be uh, just kind of figuring out what their goals are for the hour. You know what, how does how does what we're going to work on in this hour? How is that going to maybe enhance your performance out on the golf course? You know what are your goals in playing golf? People play golf for a lot of reasons, so I think one of the things you got to do is make sure you're getting it. Now, I I, I might. And everybody out here works with really skilled players, but then you also get the the beginner or the higher handicapper. So um, depends on on where they're coming from. But uh, I think the first thing I will do is just figure out, okay, what's the ball flight that we need to change today in this hour that makes it worth your time? What are some of those key questions that you ask in the I, interview process? Yeah, I just I just try to go down the road of you know what what are your goals, and then also too what if if you only if I've only got an hour with you and you're going to pay me some money, what's the ball flight that I can fix that within an hour that you're going to say it, it was worth the time? And if I don't fix it, I won't charge you. Really? Yeah. I like that. Okay. Might, the hour might be a four-hour lesson at the end of it, but it <laughs> might take me a while. <laughs> you have to push a few well, lessons that, back. That, that, that ball flight's going to change. We're not quite it. done yet. <laughs> You know, if you didn't know this, but you can change track <laughs> to 10,000 feet in altitude and oh, yeah. 100 degrees. It, it'll go further. Trust I'll, me. <laughs> done that before keep bitching about distance well i can fix go. that no worries, exactly it. i love it all right so we mentioned the top 100 summit which we just had last week or actually this week mm-hmm. quick turnaround for me um what are some of the and it's awesome to, to be a part of that i know some of you guys in this room have been there um what were some of your takeaways what did you what did you like or is there any learning moments uh from the week i, I think it's um I think the presentations were really interesting. I, I, I did enjoy the artificial intelligence uh, yeah, presentation. Yeah, I, the, that, uh, that's kind of interesting to me, and I think the world has changed from an instructor standpoint, at least from my perspective. Sports, but, sports box AI is what he's talking about. Yeah, sports box AI. Yeah. I think that the, the ability to take a, a cell phone camera image and throw it into a 3D animation is, is – and what would appear to be fairly accurate is yeah, is it pretty, seems to be is pretty interesting. I mean, I, my my generation, we just watch ball flight and we fix ball flight, and and so all this new stuff is pretty amazing. I'm not too sure of the application maybe for me in a golf school set, set right? Because of time, sure. But it's still pretty interesting. I thought that's a, a going to be the future of coaching. For yeah, sure. we've been looking for yeah. something that 
where you don't have to hook up yeah. wires and the, wire, yeah, the, wireless and stuff the and time that. it takes to do that, I think is going to be amazing. Yeah. A lot of, you know, a lot of the stuff that uh, we use in our school is, is based on time. Uh, if you got 28 yeah. people in a golf school and, and K vest and some of this other technology is really, it's really great. I mean, we, we have some of that technology and, and it's really, you appreciate it, but the time it takes in the setting I'm in most of the time is just challenging because you really can't afford to, take 15 minutes with somebody and run them through set them 10 up. swings yeah. and set them up. And, and so we're kind of looking for things that can be quick and easy and give good, good information, good, good data points that you can reference. So I, th I think that's for us, that's going to be something we're looking at for sure. Um, yeah. And, um, but I think that's good. I thought the DeChambeau thing was just fascinating. That was cool. That was right. Yeah. The they did a, there. yeah. Como and then one of the golf yeah. channel or golf yeah. magazine. And it's funny as, uh, you know, we talk to our students about how important it is to get out on the golf course and practice and how <laughs> transfer practice is so important and we're going to give you drills and we're going to give you ways to practice on the range and but you want to get out to the golf course and work on it out on the golf course yada 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 and this guy says eh, i don't believe in that <laughs> it was the yeah. best thing ever. he's he trying was. to hit the perfect shot for like yeah, six hours on the range yeah, i don't care but he did preface it by saying that he he built his skills yeah. as a junior golfer yeah. and through college so he's, he's like, I got all the shots, yeah, I got but shot. I'm still trying to hit that one shot. Yeah, it, was, it, was, <laughs> it was pretty cool, yeah, wasn't it? Was polar opposite of what everybody in the audience probably does on a daily basis with their students. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. I thought the Kyle Berkshire thing was pretty good. Too. Yeah, long drive guy, pretty pretty amazing. That guy can play, too. Like, it's cool to see, like, he's, he's yeah. got a chance. Yeah, he was, it was interesting. He, I think he hit a ball that went four, was it 434, Rick? 418? Yeah. yeah. Jeez. Was, yeah, just yeah. off the just off the charts, and didn't even funny. It didn't even look like he was really. I mean, at least I mean, yeah, he's like he's got his backswing's gotten shorter. Yeah. You know, like it looked well, like a normal like yeah, a tour crazy. player, yeah. not crazy. like somebody that's just like trying to kill it. Just what we need is one more guy hitting it further than everybody else. Unbelievable. Yeah, I thought. Um, just give you my thoughts. Rick mm -hmm. Rick Sessinghouse was phenomenal. Yeah. He coaches. He's his mental coach for Colin Morikawa. I mean, check this guy out. I mean, I've I've spent some time with Rick. I mean, talking about the epitome of professionalism and like his presentation skills were so good. Yeah. I thought that was really. I mean, because I think that's and that's another question I was going to ask you. And I know a little bit in the golf school setting, you don't get to do as much coaching probably as you'd want to do. Because yeah. I know I've sort of shifted my focus from teaching mechanical to a lot more coaching in the last 10 15 years mm -hmm. um and he was a, a really good example i think of yeah. that like what's the difference between teaching and coaching for you and have you made any changes in your golf schools maybe to to yeah. add a little bit more of that we we, we try to we try to get uh, the dilemma we are, we're always facing is it's still outcome based i mean mm -hmm. if the person's not hitting it straighter than they were on day one on day four day three probably by their definition, it wasn't successful. So right. uh, we're always under the gun to produce a result, not only visually, but also, you know, video is easy to show changes because they're not necessarily recognizing that the club face was just a degree open and it's still cut a little bit. They're looking at the overall shape of it or the direction of the club and things like that. Uh, but yeah, we try to talk a lot about um, in, in on-course time with the students, which is probably where we spend more time in that arena where we start talking strategies we start talking mm -hmm. in terms of expectations how to set your goals a little bit more reasonable if they're a little bit off the charts so i think probably more of the coaching is done out on the golf course than it is in the arena of okay t here's takeaways two inside let's get the club face squared and, you know kind of move on yeah yeah yeah, it makes sense. I know we did a lot of on-course stuff when I was yeah. at Dana's. Yeah, we've always found that that yeah. is very helpful. I mean, I, mm -hmm. our students will, every, you know, the, you get the summary of the year's responses from the uh, survey folks that give us feedback on what the students say. And the on-course tends to be, every year, the most important thing for them. Because they just don't play, they don't necessarily go out with, with good players and don't have that opportunity. And right. I think if you're giving individual lessons at a club it if you're not doing some of that you you might have an, a really big opportunity in fact we had 10 people in the golf school today and all 10 of them said that they've never been out on the golf course with their pro back home 
Wow. That's not a criticism. I mean, that's not a criticism yeah, it, of Pro back home because they're probably, easy. yeah, it's just they're, I'm sure they're as busy as everybody else is. So, but it is a, it, it is an opportunity to where you could spend time with the people out on the golf course and, and enhance their experience playing. Yeah. Love it. So with all the new information that we've, I think, gleaned really in the last 10, 15 years with all the measurement devices, mm-hmm. technology, you know, the scientists, you know, that have gotten involved, which I think has helped my coaching mm-hmm. tremendous yeah. amount because I want to know the facts. Yeah. Can you think of two or three things that you used to teach maybe 15 years ago that you don't teach now? Or also, what are some of the new things that maybe you've learned in the last five to 10 years that you implement into your coaching? I think the probably the technology technology that's helped me the most is more the track man data. And I, and I think I have to kind of highlight that I, I grew up with a guy, Jim Hardy, that was a protege of John Jacobs. So every lesson he gave was based on ball flight. I mean, I had the, the opportunity as a kid watching Jim teach in California, I, I watched John Jacobs give a lesson where he never saw the swing. He just looked at the ball flight. He would stand next to the person hitting balls. He was never told if it was a male or a female. I mean, I'm sure he figured it out pretty quickly, but he was watching these shots being struck and never saw the swing and would change ball flight just by the ball flight. So he would, if the person was hitting a pull cut, he would just confirm that the, the, that the ball started out left of the target and faded because that's sometimes hard to see from where he was standing. And he would make a change in the person's swing within probably 15 shots. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, and and never get caught up in the cosmetics of it, but more the delivery of the club head to the ball. So I think the track man information has been helpful for me because it kind of made it a little bit more precise. I mean, every, every, we've always known there's face over, right? I mean, the, the argument that people made a few years ago that track man was the first group that ever talked about face over, right? That they need to read the PJ teaching man yeah. because Gary Warren said it years ago. I think Jim McLean said it as well. Like, yeah, I mean, everybody well, did. I mean, the Jacobs. Yeah. You know, I mean, if the divot goes right and the ball almost hits the guy's left foot, I mean, it ain't that freaking hard to figure out that the, the face was closed. I mean, so, but I think what's nice is the the track man gives you a sense of the the the, re, the relationship of face to pass. So I think that's helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, I think too, probably what has been helpful too is the influence of off center hits. I mean, not going back to the the ball flight laws of face and path and angle of attack and club head speed. I think probably for us, the centerness of contact was something that I, I didn't pay as much attention to. My assumption was that the face and the path being neutral to the target line, being going in the right direction, the impacts would still be pretty centered, and they would get better, which they do most of the time with a better path and a better face. But I think what's, um, what's interesting is how influential a toe hit can be that you might not, at least that, that I wouldn't recognize necessarily by the sound. Mm-hmm. Uh, and our, you know, if you're on a range and you can't really see where the ball's landing, which is our our range, it's hard to tell that it's eight yards short. It 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 felt good to me, and sometimes a student would say that felt great. And that screen that yeah, they have now, I think, is so useful. Yourself. I keep it up yeah. all the time to see. Yeah, it it just kind of gives you a sense of it. Now it's, it's it has its flaws because it's not as accurate sometimes if you've got a different head design or something like that that you sure. need to calibrate in there. But still, though, it's still to know that the off center hits can be as influential on the overall carry distance is is pretty important. So that that to me has probably been the most influential thing. So for me, the path, the face was always the primary thing. My assumption was the club head speed was always going faster because I could see the ball going further. Mm-hmm. But really what we've seen with the track mandate is that their swings aren't going any faster. Their smash factor's going up. Right. So the Efficiency of the strike's yeah. better. Yeah. Anything technique-wise that's changed in uh, the way you teach now? And eh, not really. I mean, from no? the standpoint of the, the blueprint of what we're trying to do technique-wise. Well, I mean, the, 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 method, all, the, the method of what we're trying to do or the, yeah. the template of what we're trying to get. I, we're big fans of the club head being on plane, the delivery of the club head, on a neutral path with the club face square, the hit more centered on the face, and good use of the dynamic loft. I mean, so I don't think many people would argue too much with that. But so we're yeah, that's really never changed. Mm-hmm. But that's you know that's a Jacobs. You know, that was yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not like it's any. It probably would be more illustrated, better illustrated if we had video of like yeah. what is what do you like in the delivery position? Yeah. What's Comparison, the club face yeah, need to look yeah. like? The release patterns and such. Yeah. And that's so, kind so, of tough and broad. Yeah, I mean, so for us, it's it's kind of always been that trying to improve the ball flight. 
And so, you know, that the overall goal hadn't changed much, but certainly the way we present the material or certainly the way we come up with swing cues that can influence, influence that. I mean, I, I think probably, and again, back to that environment of team teaching, mm-hmm. you've got to be careful with what you add because, you know, I, I work with, well, today I, I worked with two great instructors. Paul McRae was teaching today and Nicole Wel- Weller. I mean, two staff members that are just brilliant teachers. They're great with people. They're really skilled at making a swing change. But the trouble is if I go in there and Paul or Nicole's has the person working on something and I interject something, well, I might mess up what they're doing simply because the person can't do two things at one time. Hmm. So I, th- I think if anything, the things that have changed in, in my approach to it is just making sure that we're not adding another layer to what they're working on and we don't get anything done. Yeah. I mean, you know, basically you – I mean, the rule of thumb that, that we go by is that if you've been working on somebody's takeaway and maybe the club gets inside, it gets a little closed, just pick or, you know, picture something like that. And they're working on a better takeaway, the club's more on plane, the club face is a little bit more square, and then you introduce something a little bit too early in their progress, they'll lose what they were working on because their attention will drift from that takeaway to the takeaway and something else. So we're always aware of, okay, when do we add the next step and is it the right time to add it? So I, so I don't think that the template of what we're trying to do is change as much as the delivery of the information. I, I love that. Yeah, I, I talk about that all the time, especially with students that yeah. they want to interject no, no, their no. stuff, right? They're it's like we're working on something, things course. are going well, then they ask a question, right? I, I and it's like, them. do you do you answer the question or not? Yeah. And I'll explain to them, like, I don't really want to answer that question because now we're going to change yeah. the pathway that we've – the consciousness just changed. Yeah. Well, I, I, be, because I tend to use the video a lot, I'll, I'll typically be the one that's doing the videos for the student. Um, I'll just, if they have an idea, I'll just say, well, let's throw it on video. And they'll say, well, you know, I've been really thinking about uh, you know, what, you know, what, what X, Y, Z. Well, let's see if that changes the delivery of the club head back to the golf ball. You're swinging 12 degrees out to end, and the club face is about 14 degrees open. So let's see if <laughs> holding that angle a little longer is going to help. Yeah. Get some more lag. Well, Trackman says it's a little bit more out there. <laughs> I didn't think that was possible, but you're, you're actually more out there now. Let's not do that. Let's, let's just move on to something else. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, one, technology self <laughs> One of the things that I, I talk about a lot on the podcast, and I like to ask top, top coaches like yourself, is the blend between the IQ and the EQ, mm-hmm. right? And I think we, with the internet nowadays and with all this great certifications and uh, the awesome coaches, you can get the – information the iq pretty quickly quicker than we could when we were younger right no, 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 no. but it's the eq that i think separates the top coaches right yeah. the, the bedside manner the empathy yeah. being able to ask the right questions like how do you is that a trainable skill one and do you share or do you do any of that training with your staff to improve that because as young coaches i mean we, we we weren't that good at it when we came in yeah right being able to build the relationships with the, with and yeah, getting people to trust you. Yeah. To it, yeah. Is there anything you could share? Well, I break it into three categories. Uh, we've always done it uh, this way with within the Club Corp family, and then now just Pinehurst. Me, I, I think you guys know that years ago we were Club Corp property, so we were one of 250 properties around the world and had golf schools all over the place. And so we would try to train people, and we broke it into three knowledge areas: the knowledge of learning, the knowledge of teaching, and the knowledge of the game. And actually, the, that same kind of templates the PGA strategy right now with education. So the idea of uh, most of the teachers that you'd see at a facility that you go visit or you take a lesson from probably are pretty good at knowledge of the game. So, so imagine the three categories, knowledge of teaching, knowledge of learning, knowledge of the game. And it kind of goes this way. And there would be a beginner, intermediate, advanced, and expert. Most of the staff, when we tested them of these properties, would come out, you know, well beyond a beginner level of knowledge of the game. But they really wouldn't have a good idea of how people learn a motor skill. They wouldn't really know how to deliver the information. And so we didn't spend a lot of time on the methodology as much as, okay, what's the best way to present this material? What's the best way for you to... Uh, talk them through. Again, this is where our research has been helpful. The, you know, is it better to use an internal cue or an external cue? Um, do you re- do you really, as the instructor, do you really understand how someone will learn a motor skill? I mean, what are the, the steps to it? And so we try to, this again, this started back in 92. How, you know, what, what can you do in the motor learning discipline that's going to help your students become 
better. And what do you need to know about that? And so we've always tried to improve the knowledge of learning and the knowledge of teaching categories more so than knowledge of the game. Because most of the people that are working for you, at least from, from my experience, are skilled players. They have a lot of background in the game. They have a passion for it. So if you get into a discussion on, you know, is the golf swing going to be two plane or one plane, or do you get, you know, go more with the vertical shaft on the back swing and flatten into shallow it out in the down swing, they can talk about that. But then you say, what are the three steps to motor learning? They it's just, uh, I never learned yeah. that. Or learning so, styles yeah. or <clears throat> like dealing with people, right? And that's yeah, the... just, yeah, and so we, we were lucky enough years ago to team up with a guy named Dr. Paul Shemp from University of Georgia yep. and Bob Christina, Dr. Bob Christina. And so those guys became really our experts in knowledge of, of learning and knowledge of teaching. And then the knowledge of the game was, you know, back to ball flight, trying to fix the ball flight. So we kind of went about it that way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we try to do things that would, would help our staff and help our teachers. Uh, I think with the the team I work with, you know, the the Kelly Mitchams, the Paul McRae's, the Nicole Wellers, Jeff Lynch, I mean, the list goes on, Robert Hoadley, Ryan Anderson, Ryan Spack, all these teachers are great teachers. Um, in some cases, they learned it through trial and error and experience. Some cases, they were given the opportunity to listen to Christina and Shemp talk, and so they learned through that process. Um, sometimes they just instinctively do it the right way. I mean, there's yeah. tacit knowledge that these people can gather and I mean that's where observation can be helpful where you learn yeah. just by observing somebody do something that they're not even aware of you can take away good information yeah and that that leads me into my next question it is when a young coach or let's say a PGM student comes out of college or he's working for you wants advice on how to get better at teaching the blueprint I think has changed a lot mm -hmm. over the years but I think there's some still solid ways to do that what advice would you give a young coach out there i think it's changed i think over the years i would have been telling them go out and observe other teachers again it's probably because i spent two years watching a guy teach who every day would let me watch him teach and ask me questions after the lessons and grill me on what did i see you know you know why didn't you you know why didn't why aren't you asking me the question about the ball flight? I mean, he, he required me to be attentive and pay attention, so I learned through observation. So I've always been a fan of that. Uh, but I think anymore, that's maybe not all that. I mean, it's important. I don't mean that. But it's, it's one of those things where maybe it's not as important as it was for my generation because the technology gives you insight into things. Interesting. I mean, yeah. you sit there and watch Jim Hardy give five lessons and – you know, he had different strategies with the way he fixed the swing cues, I mean, or the way he fixed the swing uh, issues. Uh, but at the same time, having the ability to watch video, watch it on video, the ability to watch uh, the, the data that could, a track man could give you on what was changing, that probably anymore would have been just as valuable. I, I watched him interact with the student. I watched him make the swing changes, but it was holistic and, and not – Definitely, hey, look at the path. It's gone from four degrees out to end, and now it's two. That's getting better. I'm on the right track. I mean, that feedback is so valuable nowadays. So mm -hmm. I think observing it is, is still important, but I think probably just watching a teacher and just watching swings, maybe on, on track, man, or video could yeah. be as, as helpful anymore. Certifications that you like, any any. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a fan you would... of, I think, any, you know, we're, we'll pay for, the, the guys on staff, they can go get certified in anything they want to, we'll pay for it. You know, at least, it, minimum, we'll pay 50%. So, mm -hmm. if you want to go do that, that's fine. <clears throat> I think a lot of our guys, in general, are not out searching for the certification as much as they are the knowledge. And so, once they kind of feel like they've got the, the understanding of the tool, they're, they'll just leave it at that. You know, more time with a track man or time with a force plate or you know we've just gotten some of these jc video force plates and we're kind of we're we just got them the other day so we're going to experiment with those this winter and so the the learning curve is right now we don't know we're looking at the screen going i don't even know what that means right by the call end james the, lights <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll we'll go through that learning curve and by the end of the winter we'll have a better understanding of it and i don't you know i think it's hands-on tools in a sense there uh, but I, I, you know, this, that question came up about, you know, what's the best thing? And I've always been an observ, you know, suggesting go observe people. Yeah. And I think now, kind of, it's one of those things where you know that still could be important. But for some people, maybe just realizing the relationship with face to path 
and how mm -hmm. that track man data can give you a good insight into what that relationship is and now that matches up with the ball flight and the influence of the club being struck on the toe I mean, that could be just as influence, influencing in your teaching as mm -hmm. watching a skilled teacher presented a certain way sure so yeah i think it's good i, I know you're well read we both have read a lot of books any books that you have gifted the most or a couple of books that have influenced your career that you'd like to share yeah i, th I think uh, i'm a i'm a fan of just reading books and just it doesn't have to be golf, right? So oh, well, yeah. it can well, be anything. I think probably for me, the uh, the if I do read, it's going to be more golf books. It's a I, so, you know somebody has a new book out. I want to I want to read that. I I try to do it as much just to keep up to speed on what's uh, what people are talking about. I think if anything, I mean probably for me one of the most influential books that I ever read uh, was uh, a book uh, not on golf at all is uh, for working with juniors uh, there was a guy named Benjamin Bloom who wrote a book years ago actually comprised a lot of research and it was called developing talent in young people hmm. which it was the first time I'd ever you know heard somebody outside the well really I think probably in any field talk about how successful kids in their discipline there, there's a there's really important structure to what they how that how it's set up and I guess this was probably I mean, probably early 80s when I was reading it, trying to see, you know, how, how, does, you know, how does a really good player develop at the age of 14 or 15? What's, what's the combination of things that are happening? And he, he just pulled together a lot of research and other disciplines uh, with, with kids that were excelling at their, at their, whether it was music or whatever, it could be soccer or whatever. Pre-talent pre code, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. yeah. And uh, I thought that was fascinating. And plus I had a chance to talk to him about it later on. And it, uh, it, that to me was probably – in, impactful in that he, he was highlighting that the technique isn't everything. I mean, if you're, if you got a kid that's going to be a violinist, I mean, the, just doing the scales all day long, isn't what it's all about. And I think as a teacher, I was the school of thought of let's just, okay, you, you just hit 50 good ones. Let's hit another 50 with that same club repetition. Let's, let's do, yeah. Let's do skill practice. Basically. Skill yeah, practice. Yeah. And he was the first guy ever that I ever, ever heard in other disciplines talk in terms of, uh, we would use the term in golf, transfer practice. He talked about ways to carry that over to the performance side of things, and I thought that was pretty interesting. So that was probably one that I certainly changed my thought process. Um, I mean, uh, the, the classic books, like I said, the Search for the Perfect Swing was just awesome. And uh, the best thing about uh, talking to some of the authors is I've met the authors later on, and it was back in the day when the PJ uh, Master Professional, you had to read that book and you're tested on that book. And as you and are so one. I, and so I asked yeah. Alistair Cochran, that's right. I asked, I couldn't remember his last name, but I asked him, well, what do you think of your book being part of the Master Professional study guide? And he just said, why would you do that? That thing's so old. And I thought, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Why do we do that? That's actually a good question. Yeah. Uh, and it was, uh, but it was, again, it, it, you know, research is always changing. Research is always giving us new insights. And so I just try to keep up with stuff like that. It's great. Yeah. So maybe not even so much books anymore. It's just studies. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's definitely transfer. I know the young guys that I have mentored aren't, aren't reading very much because yeah. it's so much is on the internet, well, right? You can watch a video, you can read a, white paper on the internet it's, it's it has changed uh, completely my my yeah. generation we'd watch a guy teach or a gal teach and we'd read their book maybe watch him play if you're lucky enough you'd get a lesson from them and you got engulfed in that methodology and and you, maybe that might be the only one you really ever drifted you, know, you stayed with the whole time yeah. so it's just interesting how now it's and just the wealth of information is scary yeah so as we know the the roads to success is bumpy We've all had our roadblocks and failures. So could you share a failure or a roadblock that has set you up for later success? Hmm. You'd call my wife. She has <laughs> good answers on that one. <laughs> if you're married, you know what I mean. Uh, I, I don't know. I, don't, I think I've been, I'm not too sure. I'd, I'd have to give some thought to that. I have been extremely lucky in, in my path because of just being in the right place at the right time. I mean, uh, stumbling into watching Jim Hardy. I, I went to watch Jim Hardy teach because I wanted to work on my game. I didn't realize, well, who, I mean, in 1982, didn't know the guy was going to be a Hall of Fame teacher. He was, this, right. he was an instructor out in California at the municipal golf course in Palm Springs. I mean, it wasn't like he was 
he was you know the the Tosker the flick of the day and he is I mean he he really has ended up being that but it's just yeah. one of those things where you just didn't know um, but I think probably if anything the 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 failures I've had have always been too much on the the teaching the technical side of things that have opened my eyes to other avenues other things to put attention to and again I'm I'm a creature of golf school so you got to get you got to get the technique fixed. That's that's what you're being judged on. You got two and a mm -hmm. half days on a weekend school. You're going to take uh, somebody that's swinging eight degrees out then with the club face wide open and the toe impact. And their expectation expectation is that on Sunday the path's going to be better and the face is going to be more square and it's going to be a center hit. So you really can't go down many rabbit holes because you lose time. So I'm still driven by that, I suppose. But I think probably if anything the the thing I've learned over the years is there's, there's a balance between over teaching and uh, in individual lessons. You, you've got to have a better balance of it. I, I, I kind of approached individual lessons like a golf school. I'm just going to give you everything you need to know in an hour, where it used to <laughs> usually be three days. You know, but yeah. it doesn't matter. It's, it's still the information, so you'll you'll feel like you got something out of the time. But it's it's overkill, too much. Understood. All right, so you get to answer one last question, then mm -hmm. we'll open it up to some questions from the audience. Everybody that listens to the podcast knows what's coming. If you had to get a message to the world, billions of people, and put it on a billboard, metaphorically speaking, of course, what would your message be and why? It could be a quote. It could be a mantra. It could be an idea, a picture. Hmm. Well, I don't know. That's a good one. I think probably a quote that I, I try to remind myself of on a regular basis is the uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, I think it was the guy who made the quote, his, uh, his, his quote was, what you do speaks so loud I can't hear what you say. And yeah, I think one of my me, favorite that's, poets that's one of authors. the things I remind myself is that I very often talk a lot, <laughs> I talk a lot, and then the people that I'm working with are thinking, yeah, that's, that's a really good idea. <laughs> Maybe let's do something, yeah. So I, I try to remind myself that uh, I, I tend to talk a lot, and sometimes I don't get done what needs to get done so I, I think if anything that would be my my advice to people is that just make sure you're not yapping a bunch and you get something done so i love it that's awesome I, lo I love that. that's the first the first quote or that that first quote on the on the show so uh, it's one I of my think, favorites too i mean it's, it's fantastic uh, and now the trouble is i hold people accountable for that too and you, you very often you get disappointed <laughs> there's <laughs> a lot of yapping going on out there i understand that's amazing good stuff well, thank you all right, let's take some uh, questions uh, from the audience. Krista. Eric, I've got a couple questions. Um, first of all, thank you. This is wonderful to hear your insight and sharing your story. So two questions. First of all, what would be your advice or maybe your nuggets in teaching group instruction? Because it's easy to get bogged down on one. You've got six to eight or three to okay. eight however many in front of you. So a couple of keys you've learned over the years to optimize that. And then secondly, in your golf schools and taking people on the golf course, what have you found to be kind of a trend? Because everyone they get so much instruction. I mean, the mornings are out of when you go in the afternoon and which day in the school. So what's your key to have them transition from letting go of some of the mechanics and getting out there and playing that's really, and making that easier? That's a really good question. Going Thank deep. you. That's, that's awesome. I think probably from a golf school team teaching, I think the, the challenge of it is there's a rhythm to it. And – you cannot get bogged down with somebody that's, let's say you've got eight people and there's two of you. There's a cadence or a rhythm to it that you've got to keep going. And you've got to learn to watch multiple things at the same time. Multiple people, multiple ball flights. And I think what happens is the easy thing to do is to get stuck with one person. And the trouble is the people are in, just instinctively aware that they're not getting the same amount of attention, attention as the next person. So that rhythm that you keep is very important. And there's nothing wrong with walking off with somebody topping it as long as they have a clear definition of what they're trying to do. And I think the skill set that comes from teaching group lessons uh, is that you learn how to diagnose in a couple of swings. You learn how to give the person something to work on. You recognize a drill or a training aid that can help them through the process. And what you're taking advantage of is the self-discovery that they need to do anyway. And so the cadence or the rhythm of it is you've got to keep moving and you've got to be comfortable with saying, you're going to top 20 shots in a row, don't worry about it. 
And then after the 10th hop, you're maybe three people down. You say, don't worry about it. It's, gonna, it's coming here in a second. You'll, you'll get back to it. You have to anticipate what's going to happen. I mean, there's a lot of things that are pretty predictable. If somebody's backswing is too vertical and the downswing is too steep and you shallow out the backswing, they're going to top it. It's not that hard to figure out. And if they're tending to be a, a little bit over the top with the club face open and you decide to square the club face up, they're going to hit pulls. I mean, and if you tell them, if you say, hey, I want you to do this till you start pulling it or hooking it, now they're kind of tied into it. And when they finally do that, they go, wow, how, how'd they know that? Well, just there's, there's predictability with a lot of the stuff that we do. But I think with group instruction, the most challenging thing is the, the rhythm of it and being confident that the decision you made, the diagnosis you made, and the steps you're taking, whether it's face before path, whether it's centerness of contact, whether you're working on the angle of attack, whatever ball flight law you're trying to fix, you're confident that that's going to be the first step to it. And again, I think that's back to the question of what do you want to fix? I mean, a lot of times people will say, you know, you'll, you'll be looking at them hitting a slice, and that's not even the shot that worries them. It's the toe shot that goes low. So maybe that's a different ball flight law that you're worrying about. So I think that's important. I think there's a reason that most of the top 100 teachers have background in golf schools. I think it's because it's the ideal ground to develop those skills. Uh, I, I, there's only if there's you know maybe a handful of the top 100 teachers right now that don't have golf school background, mm -hmm. and it's 20 years ago probably everybody did. But, that's a good point. but the point would be that it's just you're kind of self-diagnosing and making decisions real quickly, and you don't have time to go down rabbit holes because you can't stay that long with somebody. Improves your eye too, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, you, you, well, you got to get quicker. Maybe you prioritize. You yeah. Prioritize better. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I'm my job is to prioritize what we're going to fix with the students through the video and the track man and uh, the staff will we'll sit and talk through everybody and hey you know somebody might have a different idea so we try that and we just figure out as a group what are we going to work on but you prioritize path or face or angle of attack whatever ball flight law you want to change the most and then working with a young staff member, so well i think that helps them that's, yeah that's a challenge and you've got someone younger in there kind of keeping them yeah the, well and we and we kind of I don't, I don't know. We, the, there's not a demand as much as there an expectation is that you're not going to deviate too much. My, my goal is, uh, as, the, as the person kind of trying to choreograph all this, I don't want to change somebody's delivery of something. I just want to make sure they're trying to deliver the same information but in their own way. So I don't, I mean, there's, if you teach any group lessons, you, you don't have, you can't be the person that's always right. You can't be the person that's dictating everything. Group lessons are groups of people teaching groups of people. So you've got to make sure that everybody's on the same page that, hey, the, the toe impact's the key thing we've got to fix today. Tomorrow we'll worry about the path. And if anybody deviates from that and starts talking about something that's not in that same order, now they get scolded. But if they're still on the same page of, hey, I'm, I'm trying to fix the toe shot by changing their posture, or maybe changing their spine angle at address, hey, if it works, great. If it doesn't, let's move on to another way to do it. Who, I mean, who cares? We're trying to, we're trying to improve the ball flight. Uh, so out on the golf course, though, the, the question you, you raised about the golf course, I think for us one of the most influential things is the rehearsal swing. Uh, you can get very technical. Your students are going to get technical in general. They're going to get over, you know, they got the fire hose coming at them a little bit with what you're talking about. Uh, and what, what I've always tried to remind myself is that let's say I'm working on somebody's takeaway, and I'm just trying to get the club head to go a little straighter back and the club face not so closed. And then one of the other instructors comes up and says, hey, let's kind of add a little hinge there because that hinge is going to make the club head go straighter back and get the club face a little bit more square. And then the next person comes up and says, you know, if you soften up your arms, that's going to, well, it's all geared to doing the same thing, but the student now has heard three different things. And so we try to spend time making sure that the student is, it's resonating with the student that, hey, it's all the same thing. I just have different strategies to fix it. And now my practice session is going to be, which is the most effective for me? So we spend a lot of time trying to do that. Out on the golf course, that strategy is helpful because it narrows it down to one or two things. But I think if you were to spend time with a rehearsal swing, it can be very helpful in, in getting the results out on the golf course because it turns it a little bit less contrived into a more athletic motion. What, I do in, what we do in video is we will have people do rehearsal swings and then immediately hit a shot trying to recreate the rehearsal swing. So let's say you have somebody swinging 12 degrees out then with the club face wide open, and you've decided that you're going to fix the club face first off. So they might do a rehearsal swing where they're trying to really close the club face, and you've got cameras on it. 
you can't really get a TrackMan data on a rehearsal swing, but you can at least see what it looks like. And then maybe you want to change the path that this, you're working on the path. And so now they do a rehearsal swing that's way out to the right. They're swinging 12 degrees out then. Now you're going to try to make them swing 20 degrees out to the right. In the rehearsal swing, they will see that change and they'll recognize that, wow, that's really coming way underneath that swing plane line. But then you say, okay, do that one more time. Now hit one and let's see what you come up with when you do that exaggerated rehearsal swing. And then they see a downswing path that's probably still a little bit above plane but a lot closer, and they'll start making that connection with, boy, I have to feel the exaggeration to get it, to get the result I want, so I'll do that out on the golf course. So that's what I'm talking about rehearsal swing-wise. Feedback comes in two forms, intrinsic and augmented. Augmented is feedback from an outside source like video. So the video scenario I just gave you, the video is the augmented feedback of, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. Boy, that's really exaggerated, or it felt really exaggerated. So there's the intrinsic feedback of what it felt like to them, then they see it, and then the next swing, they're trying to recreate the same feel and still hit a shot, and they'll notice that they can't do nearly as much exaggeration as they could on the rehearsal swing. There's two forms of feedback there that are feeding off each other. And so now they'll recognize that rehearsal swings can be very helpful for me make, to make a change. So I kind of threw that rehearsal swing out, but that's the strategy there. So two forms of feedback, and you've got to help them make the, at least for us, we found it very effective to make sure they recognize the intrinsic feedback, what it has to feel like to what it's actually doing. And video is a good tool, or TrackMan can be a good tool. I mean, divot patterns. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of you know, feedback out there. It's not like the ball flight and the feedback either, but trying to make sure they're making that connection. So that's where the on-course can become more athletic and more rehearsal swing, try to reproduce it, let's go to the next shot kind of thing. And that's the challenge of on-course is that it's kind of, kind of getting to where it's not so many things they're working on, just narrow it down. And it, it's, uh, that's, I think that's the, the, the hard part, making it simple enough for them to do it on the course. That's really good. Rick? Yeah, Eric, thanks for all your work. From, yeah. Uh, years. So how do you track your students' progress after they go here for a week or three days or four days? How do you You know, we do more by, well, let me kind of go back. We've, we've done over the years, we've tried different strategies to try to get feedback from them on, on, the, um, on the experience and their progress. We have, over the years, just come to the conclusion that it's just easier just to reach out to them with an email. So we'll, we have newsletters we send out. This year we'll actually be doing something a little different, which will be kind of, I think it's going to be interesting to see the response we get. But we're going to start doing a live Zoom group lessons or just opportunities to talk through some of the research we've been doing. We just finished up an interesting study that we'll be presenting to our students just to show them, hey, we're still out here, we're still working on things uh, to try to help you improve your game and share with them that research. And then from there, try to inter interact more that way. But we do a lot of, a fair amount of communication back and forth with just how, how are they progressing. Um, I think probably the hard part for us is that so many of our students are such they don't play that much. I mean, they, they go home and they, they certainly don't practice all that much, but they certainly just don't play all that much. So I think the uniqueness of, of our school is that it's, it is truly more, you used the word earlier, an experience. Mm -hmm. Pro, you know, it's, it's a program that's based on coming to Pinehurst, having the experience of Pinehurst, and taking the, the school at the same time. Now, having said that, I think we're halfway decent at it because our return per year is 23% uh, of the people that came last year came this year. And it's that's just year by year. <clears throat> we'll have people in the school that came 10 years ago. We had a gal that came with her husband 30 years ago to the school and came again. So it's just, I think we're, we're pretty decent, decent at capturing them to come back as business. Uh, but the challenge is just getting them out there to practice and play. So, you know, we're, we're just, we struggle with that. So, uh, and I, I, you know, we've done programs in the past where we had Peter, uh, I'm drawing a blank on his name, uh, had a, uh, a statistical program that shot by shot, yeah, thank you, yeah, that we'd, we would send to people and, you know, you'd have, <laughs> you'd send out 500 scorecards and get 25 back. So, so it's just a challenge for us <laughs> to do that. But yeah. now the individual lessons, it's more the personal stuff, so we can keep track of that way. But, yeah. That's, uh, another question would be what percentage of lessons for you personally? Mm -hmm.
probably from a standpoint of my t my overall job over the course of years probably 90% teaching and 10% 10, 10 administration so my admin part of it is like this time of year we're shifting into budgets and all that stuff uh, but during the in, in the teaching component of that probably 70 probably 85% of my time is golf schools 15% individual lessons so I don't give a lot of indiv individual lessons I might give I don't know if I do two a day probably 600 a year but, but considering I'm teaching in golf schools i teach 60 golf schools at whatever i mean I'll you do just about every them. one of them yeah or all do you? Yeah. Okay. with the, uh, there's uh, we're starting at, we have a short game school that kelly mitchum heads up does a great job with that and i'd probably just mess it up so he just gets <laughs> to do that and then uh uh we're going to start uh, with nicole weller we're going to start some women only schools this mm -hmm. next year and uh I'll, again that's probably just because of the the marketing of the strategy there is we'll have another female instructor helping out gotcha yeah Yeah, I, I would agree with you. I think the the thing that I'll typically default to is just time, and that the challenge of getting people to fill out a questionnaire before they get to our school is challenging. Um, the quite honestly, in mid-April when we've got a school of 28 followed by a school of 28 followed by a school of 28. I just I run out of time to even be prepped for the next wave of people coming. So a lot of it's my failure to not do those things, but I just through years of trying, I just get to a point where I just can't keep up with it. So I, I rely on a questionnaire we do the day that they show up, and I rely on the opportunity that I have with them in video and spending time with them uh, in, in the full swing where I'm typically going to be as a chance to kind of get an overall sense of where they're coming from. Does it give me every detail that I should have? No. But again, it's kind of uh, uh, the path of least resistance that gives me the information I need. Individual lessons, I spend a lot more time on that. Yeah, and it's it's one of those things where is the the staff will get together and talk through. You know, for for example, uh, let's say it's a Tuesday morning. We've done on course with the group of 20 people out there on Monday afternoon. So the five instructors will get together and say, well, my group, this is what transpired. We've got to be careful about this person. They had a bad experience with this. You know, it's just trying to talk through. Uh, but again, a lot of the pre work that could be done, we've always been challenged by them filling out the information. Or this, you know, like a, a, a in, in some sort of questionnaire that would give us insight into them. Um, that's always a challenge, and then also too, just again, just time at some point just becomes the the culprit too. I don't disagree with it. Just uh, I do that more in individual lessons. I try to get a better sense of, of that. And I think one of the things we've figured out is that um, you know a lot of times people play golf for different reasons than we'd ever imagine, and so that one-on-one -on -one time can be very helpful. Uh, you know, we've all had the experience. I mean, that we've, we have people in our golf school that just want to experience golf because their their husband did. We had, we had a lady in our golf school one time, and Paul McRae was his, this guy's, and, and everybody that I get a chance to work with is, is really exceptionally skilled. But I remember a situation where a lady came to the golf school, and she had been married, husband passed away maybe the year before, and she had always traveled all over the world with this guy to go play he'd play golf and she would just kind of hang out and she regretted not playing golf because she you know he died of a heart attack and now she's by herself so she comes to the golf school she's 65 never played golf and shows up and it's immediate we we got to do something she's not going to pound balls for 12 you know it's just it's not the same school for her and i remember putting just saying to paul listen she's just do what you got to do to make her have a good experience. And he watched her hit a few balls. She did some chipping, some pitching. So we're on day one, she did a little video work, never picked up a club. Yeah. And he took her out on course number three after lunch, and they played the first hole in number three. And she hit a couple of shots up in the air. And she turned to him and said, I now know what my husband was, was talking about. This is awesome. Wow. Her school, by the way, ended Monday afternoon. 
She never came back. She didn't have to. She wouldn't get to play golf. She wanted to. She was trying to get a sense of what in the hell was this guy doing all these years. <laughs> that, and Paul is so brilliant with people that he he in, just instinctively figured out how to make it happen. And I, I said, "Well, what did you tell her?" Uh, he said, "Well, I told her that her husband would be proud of her." Oh, and it's like, shit, dude, that's awesome. What a great story. And it and it's and that's the connection that you can have as an instructor. So her golf school ended that Monday afternoon. She didn't need to come back. She would. She just hung out at the hotel. But it was one of those things that that's where that information could be helpful. But, again, we get bogged down with just volume. And so we try to connect in different ways that try to do the same thing. Yeah. Brad? Uh, on that note that you just mentioned about the volume, is there a point where you feel like quality goes down versus the volume? And where do you think it goes Absolutely. It depends on the staff that I have. Uh, we can manage 20 people easily. 24 gets a little more challenging. If I've got the, the, the group that I would normally have, I can do 28 and still keep the, the – but there is the threshold of you're getting kind of a little bit out there with the numbers to where it's hard to have that uh, interaction with them. But, again, I, if you surround yourself with the group I, that I have, that I work with, uh, it's, it's not hard to do 28 people. I mean, think I – mean, I mean, I, you guys probably know some of these people, but Nicole Weller, Jeff Lynch, Paul McRae, Robert Hoadley, Kelly Mitchum, these, Brian Anderson, these people are really skilled at what they do. They're exceptional. And I, and so, and I think the unique thing about them as individuals, they're all very skilled, but when they come together, they're actually better. It's, it's kind of that team teaching can be really beneficial uh, for the student. And they somehow have just figured out a way to work as a team that, uh, really maximizes stuff. They kind of feed off each other. You know, and, and Nicole knows that Paul's going to say it one way, so she's going to say the same thing a different way with, in her style. And the person's still getting that same information, but they're getting it from two different directions that now they figure out which one's best for them. And then Brian Anderson will come in and say it a certain way. Kelly Mitchum will have a certain approach to it. But again, it's always geared towards you know, the same goal. It's just different ways to say it. And so that's what I, I'm blessed with. Is I, I work with a group of people that are just phenomenal that way. You know, that's, that's an interesting thing. I, I, you know, back, I remember in 1994 when I became the director of instruction and the director of the golf school's kind of dual roles, I, I took over both of those. Um, I would say that probably, there, in fact, there used to be a book published, which was called Golf Schools in the United States. And there were 172 golf schools that were on, in the book. And I think now the, uh, I mean, couldn't even tell you how many there are now, but there's not nearly that many. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were successful enough to where they bought an ad and they advertised and somebody felt compelled to put a book together of golf schools. That's how popular golf schools were back in that time period. So I think over the years it's just dwindled down because it's a tough, it's, it's a tough business. It's, uh, I think probably we're, and, and Pine Needles does some great programs too. They've, they've maintain the their success so i think it depends on the facility more so than anything else can you keep up with things some of the guys and gals that i know that that do their own golf schools are at private facilities where they really can do whatever they want to do because the the membership supports it, it it's kind of a unique environment for that instructor where another person coming in might not get that luxury but i think it's it's kind of unique to find her so i'm not too sure if we'd ever see a, an increase in golf schools like we had in days gone by but uh, i think it's just facility driven as much as anything else hmm. that's for me that at least that's my thought of it sean Yeah, we did. Actually, we started over the years, we did, we've, we've incorporated a lot more on course. So our, our old school back when Haney was, Hank was here and Mike LeBove and those guys, we did uh, two classes in the morning, broke for lunch, came back and did a third class. And then the, the students would go out and play and we might go play a hole or two with them. And over the years, we just, the feedback of the students and probably this took place back in 96 or something like that. We started doing all the classes before lunch and then going, having a quick bite, and then taking them out on the golf course and being with them on the golf course from roughly 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock, 3.15, and do an on-course out there. Hmm? Both days? Uh, so, yes, yeah, so for a weekend school, Friday, Saturday, and for a week school would be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Yeah, so if, if it's a full-day golf school activity, 
two and a half hours of its on course, two hours and 15 minutes of its on course. And again, that's that presents its own challenges with pace of play and everything. You got to move people around. I mean, mm -hmm. so there we've learned over the years how to how to do that. And it's just one of those things that we get a lot of good feedback from people. I think, I think also too, we kind of figured out that pounding more balls just doesn't necessarily make them better. I mean, there's a threshold where people get tired, and now you're just. I mean, you know, one of the key ingredients to, or th there's six guidelines to effective practice, and and none of them are hit balls until you're dead tired. That's not that's not on the list of six things for effective practice. Uh, in fact, I was looking at a book by Mickey Wright, uh, just a guy that I give lessons to gave me the book. He thought I'd enjoy reading it. I'd read it years ago, and I, but I forgot in her, her passage or her par, uh, her part on uh, practice, how she approached practice. One of the lines she said was, "I never practice if I'm in a bad mood or tired." Hmm. And I thought that's pretty good advice, but we kind of our students go out there and just pound balls and it's just it, at some point it just doesn't get you anywhere so the on course was as much derived from they really enjoy it plus they're so tired why are we wearing them out hitting more drivers let's go out on the golf course and show them how to play that's great david Oh uh, no, we we try to. I guess we have a. You know, I think uh, the methodology of what we're kind of trying to do. Certain paths to the to the swing. Certain club face positions, grips, that could be influential. I guess probably. I mean, these are kind of general statements, but we try to get the club on plane with most people, backswing and downswing. If they error a little bit from the inside, it's fine as long as the the low point of the swing isn't too far behind the ball. Uh, certainly, we fight a lot of over the top, so we're not. 7% of our students are swinging too much from the inside, so that's not very high percentage. Most of the time we're working on path. Um, we probably try to fix face before path, generally. We probably try to fix low point uh, before something else. So you just, yeah, or, or angle of attack, sorry, just using a different term, but yeah, angle of attack. Um, so yeah, we, we try to have match we try to we try to do things in in, in a logical order uh, I'll never I'll never try to change what their their kind of their style of s talking about the information but it's certainly going to be pretty basic standard stuff that's not going to deviate too much from the norm um, again we, we probably you know, again we're probably more face driven than path but we certainly see patterns of the path being out to end Show me a swing that the face had an opening when the club head's above plane. I'll show you that that's one out of 100 probably. And when the path is coming from the inside, usually it's coming from the inside because the club face is too close. So there are certain patterns that we're aware of. And we just try to match those up as best we can. Um, I guess thankfully we don't see a lot of over-the-top swings with a dead shut club face because that probably wouldn't stay on our driving range. But yeah. so does that, I mean, that answer it kind of in, in the, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we try to... Uh, I mean, again, it's back to if we dis if we've determined that the club face position is the key. If somebody says, "I think the grip is the factor," I think their grip is in a, their hands are on it in a way that's making the face get open. We'll tr let's try it. That's that's let's try that first, and we'll go from there. Then other times, it's because they've been trying to rotate their forearm. So I'm going to take that swing cue out and make them feel like their forearm doesn't rotate. Okay, that's another way to do it. There's a lot of ways to change it, but let's make sure that we're changing the grip because it's influencing the face, and we think that's a way, that's something we need to address. Uh, I think what probably makes me crazy is when we get somebody that's not maybe as much experience with the other group of teachers where they're starting to work on something like weight shift, and we're still looking at, hey, maybe the club face is still open in the backswing. Mm -hmm. And I'm not too sure weight shift's going to change the club face. Yeah. Now, if it does, great, but I, you know, Kind of doubt it. Not getting ahead of their learning, basically. Yeah. 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 Good. Anybody else? Uh, you mentioned earlier talking about like not going too quick um, with the progress and somebody's making one day this place to another or getting on to the new one. Have you found, like, how have you found, like, when that right time is? I, I, 
I let the student dictate some of that. I'll ask them, are you okay with us adding one more thing here? Or let's go into the next step. But then I also, if, if, there's, a, uh, if there's a concern over that, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, I'll use that example of the club face, maybe going back closed. Okay, if we had, had this happen, this, this uh, in fact, it, was, it happened today. It was, it was kind of an interesting example of this. We had a gal in the school that the club head went a little outside, got a little closed at waist high, got a little, was still a little shut at the top of the backswing, which typically if you're going to see a shut club face that's upright in the backswing, it's going to shallow out a bunch in the downswing because there's no way to hit it above plane. They're going to come from the inside. So she's swinging about 9 or 10 degrees from the inside, and the club face is closed enough to where the ball is deflecting left at impact. So you're seeing path right, club face closed, and it's going way left. Uh, she was getting the club face more square. She was getting the, the path of the club better going back. It didn't necessarily change the downswing path, but with the club face more square, a square face to a, a path that's out to the right, she's getting a lot more height to it. The low point's still a little bit too far behind the ball, but at least she's getting some shots up in the air. And for the first time, she's hitting a driver. So, I mean, we're making progress. Um, and, and one of the staff, rightfully so, was trying to get her to move the bottom of the swing forward because the, the irons were still bottoming out a little bit behind the ball because the path is too much from the inside. So the low points, you know, point two behind the ball. So just a little bit up behind the ball. And she started trying to get turned through. Well, the, I mean, it's not a bad idea. It was actually the next step to it. But the litmus test is what did her backswing do when she started putting her attention yeah. to the low point trying to move the bottom of the swing forward? Her club went outside a little bit, got a little shut. And so that tells us, okay, it's a good idea to work on that, but it's a little bit too early in the game plan. So there's another thing you could do there. In this case, you could put her on a downhill lie and have her hit shots where she's working on her takeaway, and now she's, by just the slope itself, downhill lie, she's turning through it a little bit better. And so now you're manipulating that low point without really talking a whole lot that's, about that's it. That's the constraint sled yeah, yeah. approach that we talked earlier. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Changing the environment. So that – helped with that process and then she could still put her attention to the backswing so she's able to do now both without really knowing she was doing that the the, the additional thing um, it, you know one of the best tools that I've ever used in fact is uh, a T I put one in my pocket just because this typically comes up if you want to change somebody's impact Put a tee on the outside of the ball or put a tee on the inside of the ball. So let's say they tow a lot of shots. Here's the golf ball. Put the tee right there. And you're, you're wanting to do something different in the downswing, but they're still not quite controlling their backswing. We'll have them work on the backswing, but just try to hit the tee as they're hitting the golf ball. So that just takes the hit from being a little bit on the toe, get it more centered. And so you're, again, changing the low point, maybe changing the path a little bit or whatever you're going to change there to get the hit more solid. But, again, they can still work on one thing, and then you turn the other into more of an athletic, hey, just try to hit that tee when you're hitting the golf ball. Doing the same thing, but just without the conscious effort of, of manipulating something else. Great question. It's yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that's the challenge. I think the litmus test is are they able to do what you've just added and still do what you were having them work on? That's great. Anybody else? Awesome. Give it up for Eric Alpenfeld. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Great stuff. Thank you. What's up, everyone? Guru back here again with a couple of things before you jump off. Uh, first, big thank you to Eric for coming on the show and being a part of our Carolina section teaching summit. Uh, it was fantastic. I thought he shared some great information, and his story was incredible. Uh, knowledge and his insights on coaching were off the charts good. If you want to check out his golf school or reach out to him go to pinehurstgolf.com and check out his academy and his many fine instructors as well uh, make sure you go to the app store and download the golf guru app i would appreciate that and you can follow and reach me on twitter or instagram at golf guru tv appreciate the love appreciate the follow i'm putting a lot of content on my instagram lately and check out mine and follow my stories also, check out my website at golfgurutv.net where you can find videos, articles, and more information on my teaching and coaching. And if you have a question or a comment about the show or just me in general, you can email the show at golfgurushow at gmail.com or just hit me up on the DM like most people do. I promise I will do my best to get back to you. Music 
on the podcast is by Kevin McLeod and Zach Mullet. And as I always leave with you, for you searchers and learners out there, study, practice, teach, and then pass it on. Thanks so much for listening. I'll talk to you next time.